us as women. But I think it's really important. I'm going to say this throughout any hormone talk where there is a conversation around female hormones. I think it's really important that men listen, because if men know more about female hormones, they can support the women in their lives and they can support the women in the gym. And I think that's a really lovely place to be. So um, don't think that any part of this isn't for you. So let's get going. I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'm Natalie. I am a clinic director and a nutritional therapist. I'm also a certified functional medicine health coach as well. I run Integral Wellness and uh, the clinic and me and my team specialize in blood sugar um, and cardiometabolic health. And if we're wondering sort of what does that really mean? I've put in this section here, I've put some examples as to what comes under blood sugar balance and cardiometabolic health. So we're thinking about weight loss, we're thinking about PCOS, we're thinking also about things like type 2 diabetes, which is continuously on the rise, high blood pressure and high cholesterol, heart issues, whether it's recovering from a heart attack or dealing with things like atrial fibrillation, that comes under the same bracket. And then fatty liver, either non-alcoholic fatty liver, which is um, on the rise as well, um, or alcohol-induced fatty liver, and then also stress-induced issues as well. Because we, when we have a huge amount of stress in our lives, we have a huge amount of inflammation. And when there's a lot of inflammation, we end up with um, issues in regards to our cardiometabolic function. And we're going to dive into that inflammation side a little bit more today. So when we think about metabolic health, is there anybody I've just turned it so I can see your faces. Has anybody heard of the phrase metabolic health? Do people understand what it means? Give us a nod if you understand what it means and a thumbs up. Give us a thumbs down if you don't. Never. It's just it's OK if it's not a phrase you've come across, because that would be the most common answer. We often don't say, doctor, I think I've got metabolic health issues. We often say, doctor, I've already tired. Doctor, I've got a headache. Doctor, I can't lose weight. So metabolic health really means the ability for our food to be used beneficially by the body and efficiently by the body so that the body can take food and make it into energy and use that energy. And that means that we can function at full capacity. So when we have type 2 diabetes, we've got high blood sugars, when we've got PCOS, and if it's insulin, uh, insulin resistant PCOS, we end up having an impact and a negative impact on our metabolic health, our metabolic function, the body's ability to take food, convert it into energy, and use that in a really efficient, beneficial process is compromised. And that's why it comes under this umbrella. And that's why all of these systems come under that similar umbrella. So we'll dive into this a little bit tonight, because this is really topical um, in regards to our conversation. And it really links a lot with inflammation. So these are some of the other feelings that you'll get. As I say, we don't say I've got metabolic health issues, but you might say I'm exhausted. I've got low energy. You might say I can't stop craving in between meals. My hormones are a nightmare. I keep getting brain fog. I'm really thirsty. I mean, we're all thirsty at the moment. I've got plenty of drinks here because it's hot. Um, you, you go to sleep, you wake up in the morning, you don't feel very well rested, you might have some gut issues, you might go to the toilet all the time for a wee, you might have some skin issues. These would all be feelings and symptoms of poor metabolic function. So this is often what I talk about when I'm talking to people about it, but in my head, in my scientific nutritional science mind, I'm thinking about um, our metabolic function. So let's dive into belly inflammation in the first instance. Inflammation, we're thinking about that sort of tie around the middle, the weight around the middle, the weight that a lot of us get frustrated with, that we try to get rid of, that we might find feels a bit stubborn sometimes, that we might find comes back too easily. This weight around the middle, um, which can be very much an inflammatory process, is also one of the main signs of insulin resistance. Is anyone aware of insulin resistance? Again, sort of thumbs up if you are aware of it, thumbs down if you're not. No? Okay, yes, no? Right, so let's dive into it a little bit. Let's do a little bit of a recap because I think that's always really helpful. Um, so insulin resistance. When we consume food, our we swallow it, it goes into our stomach, the stomach throws it around to digest it even further. It comes out of the stomach into our intestines. 
And then the body will begin to absorb the nutrients from the food, all of the nutrients, your proteins, your fats, your carbohydrates. And then also thinking about your vitamins, your minerals, your amino acids, your antioxidants, they'll all start being absorbed into that small intestine once they've been broken down. Whenever we eat food, the body will release insulin. And the reason it needs to release insulin is in response to consume consuming and taking on sugars now there are very few meals unless you're going to sit here and just eat steak which potentially you might there are very few meals that don't contain some form of carbohydrates even vegetables will contain carbohydrates and it's really important that we consume those so we we eat them we chew it up we swallow it it goes into our stomach our stomach breaks it down even more and it breaks the bonds of carbohydrates <clears throat> into single molecules of sugar whether we're talking white rice, brown rice, black rice, or whether we're talking broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, you're still going to do the same process. Your body's still going to break it down like that. So all these single molecules of sugar replicated by these red dots here are now ready to be released into the bloodstream. The body will release from the pancreas insulin to make sure that this sugar does not stay swing, swimming around in our bloodstream. That's not where we want it. Too much sugar in the bloodstream is where we end up with type two diabetes, where the blood is too sugary. That's that destination. So the body's natural function is to say, well, here's some sugar, here's some glucose. We're gonna need to use this within our cells to create some energy, one function of energy. So insulin acts like a key. Insulin gets released by the pancreas. It goes swimming around our body like sugar and all the other nutrients do. And insulin will act like a key in a cell. We are made up of cells, by the way. We are just a billion trillion cells. It will act like a key in the cell to open the door and allow glucose, allow sugar to go into the cell ready to be used. As we talked about, that metabolic function is to be able to take sugar, use it effectively as energy so that we have a good output. And this is exactly what this illustration is showing you. So the insulin will act like a key, allow sugar to come into the cell. And then when all that, when that cell is full, the insulin comes out, door is closed, and we've probably finished our meal or we're a couple of hours after finishing our meal and we're just, we're resting, we're fasting, we're having some water. When we become insulin resistant, the insulin is still triggered from the pancreas. The insulin still does its job. It comes to the cell. It knows sugar is there. There's probably lots of sugar there, actually, because the insulin goes to its, its lock in the cell. It puts a key in the lock and the cell does not open. It is resistant to insulin. It cannot hear it. It's almost like the, the I'll roll back a minute. The reason this happens most often and there are a few reasons, but the reason this can happen most often is because we consume so many sugars, so many carbohydrates, that if that becomes an overabundance in our diet, the body gets desensitized to that constant need to manage sugar in the bloodstream. It's too much. It needed more protein. It needed more fats. It needed less volume of carbs and therefore probably a few more vegetables. And I'm sure Amir has taught you a lot about that in regards to really loading up your plate with good veggies, really thinking about your proteins and really thinking about your healthy fats. When we And we know this from a Western diet, when we overconsume those more simple carbohydrates, those sugary foods, those more beigey foods, we end up with an overabundance of carbohydrates. The body is constantly saying, insulin, I need you again, insulin, I need you again. And insulin turns up at the cells and the cells are getting really fed up of insulin. It's like somebody constantly knocking on your front door. They used to come three times a day. Now they're there six times a day. Now they're there eight times a day. And in the end, you'll stop answering your door because it's just too much. And this is where we have insulin resistance. So we need to start thinking about the fact that the cells have become a lot less tolerant to the volume of carbohydrates that are coming in. And we need to support the body because we're about to become metabolically less sufficient. So this is one of the key reasons for weight around the middle, insulin resistance. So 
as you can see here at the bottom, somebody's ability to manage their intake of carbohydrates and sugars is going to be very different to everyone's going to be very individual. And it's going to depend on a lot of different factors. So don't think that necessarily you fit into that scenario that I've mentioned. I'm giving a, a really good overview of that um, mechanical function in the in the body. But when the body has that excess of sugar, when the cell is not responding, when the cell is not hearing the body and not allowing sugar into the cell, it can't, it's dangerous for the body to allow sugar to stay in the blood. So what it tries to do is take as much of that sugar as it can, turn it into a fat, which is called a triglyceride, and store it as fat. And the easiest place to store it as fat is around the middle because it's easily accessible. It's a lot of effort for the body to go and store it down in a big toe. I mean, it wouldn't look great either, would it? But that's a lot of effort. And if the body needs some energy to go down into the big toe to get some energy back, it's just a lot of unnecessary effort. So storing it around the middle makes it really easily accessible, easy to store, easy to get out of storage when we're doing a lot of activity, when we're balancing our diet and when we're losing weight. So triglycerides are a really important marker for considering this cardiometabolic function of the body to consider that insulin resistance picture. There are other markers in regards to our HbA1c, our fasting glucose and our liver markers. But triglycerides are one that come up on cholesterol blood tests and are really quite key for having a look. So as I say, everyone's going to be different. Is everyone feeling a bit better about insulin resistance now? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Super, super stuff. I've got a full page on type 2 diabetes, which covers insulin resistance on my website as well, if it helps and you want another deep dive or a recap. But this is a nice illustration of how, as I say, whether you're taking white rice, white bread, some quinoa, some broccoli, you're going to have carbohydrates in whatever form are long molecules of sugar just bound together, the more fibrous, so the brown rice compared to the white rice, or the wild rice compared to the brown rice, the more fiber, the darker the grain, the more molecules of, of sugar are tied together. The longer it takes for the body to break those down, and therefore the slower the release of sugar into the blood, and the more your body can manage the slow release. So when you have something like gosh, if you can take something like a sweetie, that's going to be really short, simple carbohydrates, simple for the body to break down, simple for a quick release of sugar into the bloodstream. If you take something like a, uh, a wild rice, which has got eight grams of fiber per 100 grams versus the white rice, which has got two grams of fiber, you see this, that it's suddenly a more complex carbohydrate. The body takes a lot longer to break it down. It's not hit with this rush, rush of sugar. So this is uh, just an illustration to help you with that. So what about some other factors? OK, because insulin resistance is really important here. But what else? Because I'm not going to blame just one thing on weight around the middle. It's really important to consider some other factors here, too. Stress is a really big factor, um, particularly for women, actually, more than men. And that's because our sex hormones manage things a little bit differently. But stress is a big factor for, for everybody. We will store weight a lot easier um, when we're stressed. We often make um, different decisions in regards to our food choices when we're stressed. Um, and our bodies will struggle to lose and shift weight when we're stressed. So really managing stress is very important or becoming. I think it's difficult to say these days that you can never get rid of stress. I think life can be very stressful, but having ways to downregulate your nervous system and relax is really important. Toxins are really important to consider as well, whether it's heavy metals or mold, they will store in fat cells in order to protect the body from those toxins. We'll come across some others as well a little bit later on. The menopause will mean that women as females will gain weight around the middle a lot easier as estrogen drops. Our ability to um, metabolize carbohydrates is reduced. So when we used to sort of eat a cake once a week and we wouldn't see it and it wouldn't be a bother, when we go through menopause as a woman, suddenly that once a week cake shows. And it can be very frustrating, but our metabolism of carbohydrates has really changed. Our ability to become insulin resistant is a lot more sensitive. So we're a lot, a lot more at risk. Alcohol can obviously gain some weight around the middle. Disruption in the gut microbiome. So thinking about your gut bacteria, feeding the gut bugs with really good amounts of fiber and and things is really helpful, but a disruption of that can um, can also cause higher weight and, and belly inflammation. 
Um, and then an overall poor diet and sedentary lifestyle, which I don't doubt any of you have considering you're here tonight. So what do we need to think about then? If you want to think about reducing that belly inflammation, if you want to think about capturing some of those things I've talked about in regards to insulin resistance and overall inflammation in the body, we need to think about having a less inflamed and less inflammatory diet, lifestyle and environment. So as I said, stress is a huge one. I don't expect you to suddenly quit your job and go and live on a desert island. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? But stress is a really big one. So have a think about how do you downregulate? How do you have that time to just take a breath? I don't expect if, if you start with five minutes, start with five minutes. You know, if you come home from work and just think, that is a really stressful day and you're heading into potentially a busy household or you've got some other things to do. How do you just take five minutes for yourself to breathe deeply and to switch your nervous system into a calmer place? Because carrying on that stress isn't going to be helpful from an inflammatory perspective. Have a think about your gut bacteria. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit in regards to the foods, but also have a think about potentially if you've had frequent use of antibiotics, if you've had any food poisonings, um, if you have potentially had any surgeries and things where they'll um, wash you through with antibiotics as well, this can really disrupt the gut bacteria. Um, and they really matter in regards to our overall health, but also thinking about overall inflammation as well. And then consider those toxins. Think about the fact of how many toxins you come into contact with. Is there a lot of pollution around where you are? Is do you cons do you use a lot of cosmetics? I think for women, the average of I can't remember if it's weekly or monthly cosmetics, but the average cosmetics that touch our skin or, or um cosmetic ingredients that touch our skin is about 150 a week, which is a huge amount. But by the time you read all the ingredients on our face creams and our makeups and our perfumes, it very, very easily stacks up. And our body's got to manage that. It absorbs it, it's got to manage it. Plastics as well, not drinking out of plastic bottles, not heating in plastic is really important um, because the plastics will leach into food. And then also thinking, as I said, about moldy lifestyles and things like that. If there's mold in your home, to look at ways of dealing with it because you do breathe that in and the body's got to deal with it and got to put it somewhere or, or clear it. So when we think about food specifically, have a think about these up in here in green and think about favoring. And I don't think any of this is going to be of a surprise to you working with Amir, but have a think about favoring whole foods. I like to say with whole foods, what swims in the sea, walks on the land um, and grows in the ground is a really good way of thinking about whole foods. Also, what comes from what grow, uh, walks on the land because eggs come from chickens and we want those. So have a think about whole foods, have a think about really upping your vegetable game because they're really going to feed antioxidants into your lifestyle, which is going to be really anti-inflammatory. Have a think about diversity in color. Can you get a couple more colors in or a couple different ones a week when you go shopping? Can you find a new one that you've not tried before? Fiber is going to come in abundance if you make the approach with the above two there. And that's going to really help your gut bacteria because they like to eat the fiber. Same with fermented foods. Um, and that's going to really help from a gut perspective. And then thinking about the leaner pro uh, proteins compared to here in the avoids, which, again, I'm not sure any of this is going to surprise you. Have a think about avoiding those fattier proteins, um, because that's going to really help from reducing inflammation as well as the others on this list. I won't go through them because I think they make a lot of sense to you already. So PCOS, let's cover this off quickly. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. So PCOS is when the eggs in the ovaries are not maturing and releasing. That's how we ovulate and that's how we have a, a period um, once a month. Instead, the eggs end up very small um, and cyst-like. So they end up just gathering in the ovary and creating cysts. And that will create inflammation because the body is not moving the way that it expects to. It's not moving through its natural cycle. And this can reduce, can create a lot of problems. We end up with higher male sex hormones, which is um, what we tend to look for when we're testing for PCOS. Um, and that can bring around things like a deeper voice. It can bring around some hair, facial hair and things. Um, but you'll also see you end up with problems with insulin. Um, you can become insulin resistant and insulin resistance can cause PCOS um, and it can disrupt fertility. So there are four different types of PCOS. Who knew that there were four different types of PCOS? Thumbs up if you did, thumbs down if you didn't. 
I'm gonna go, yeah. It's not it's not talked about, is it? Everyone just says PCOS. So insulin resistant PCOS is when if we go back to think about insulin resistant, it's when our bodies are not responding to insulin. We've got a lot more sugar in the blood. We are starting to not um uh, we're starting to not work very um very well from a met metabolism perspective. Um, so potentially there's prediabetes on the horizon as well, and that will very easily gain weight around the middle. There's also post pill PCOS. So we start to see this surge of um, male sex hormones when we come off the pill, because the pill is simply suppressing the female sex hormones. So when we take that away, all sorts can happen. There's inflammatory PCOS. So when there is chronic inflammation, thinking about back to maybe gut issues or autoimmune conditions, skin conditions, things like that can lead to chronic inflammation and that can stimulate inflammation um, and cause PCOS. And there is adrenal PCOS, which we associate a lot more with thinking about stress and just a huge amount of chronic stress can lead to adrenal PCOS. So the ways to deal with that will all be different depending on which one you have. So whether you're balancing blood sugars, recovering from the pill, reducing your overall inflammation, like I showed you, or lowering your stress levels, they're all going to come. It's going to depend which one you have as to where we focus. And the test results should tell you which ones. If you worked with me, they did. If you work with the NHS, I'm not sure if they get this detailed. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to jump into the Q&A. Let me just. Um, OK, super. So there was a couple of questions that I got asked by me to cover. So let's jump into these quickly. Are there any that you want me to start with specifically? Amir, or shall I run through them in order? I appreciate we've got eight minutes till we have to start the call again. Yeah. Uh, so guys, now it's the time if you want to ask anything else apart from the ones that I usually have been asked quite a few times before by you, which is those main four. But if you go any other ones, uh, put on the chat box or just unmute yourself because this is the time yep. you're having two people now, right now, taking care of your, your doubts. So that's very good. Okay, you're being spoiled today. So you have that choice, all right? So let's go and just put on the chat box if you don't want to talk today. If not, we can just jump on and start with the first one, yeah? Okay. You can carry on with the first one in the same time that in the meantime that they, they might have any questions. Yeah. Let's jump into just thinking about the menstrual cycle a little bit. So as I say, I think this matters for men and women. I taught my husband all about my menstrual cycle so he could be very prepared for when I was feeling a certain way. He probably sussed my menstrual cycle better than I could. And I think that's really important because then we tag team, we become a much better team because we know each other better. So female menstrual cycle, I'm showing it how a typical menstrual cycle would work. When it goes into perimenopause, we, we can't map it this way, but this is how a typical menstrual cycle should work. So day one is the first day of bleed. And then your last day is the, you know, whether it's day 28 or 26 is the last day before your bleed starts the following one. We have estrogen, which is this pink line here, which does a lovely natural incline from the moment that we um, begin our bleed, it begins to pick up again, which is why by about day three, day four, we start to feel more like, our, more like ourselves. We get to ovulation and we're raging with estrogen and we're feeling really good and then it starts to take a natural decline and that's where we can start to see that latter part of our cycle where we don't start to feel so great we don't start to have such clarity of mind we get a bit foggy headed um and we might be a little bit irritable you've then also got um fsh and lh which is fsh is the follicle stimulating hormone it's the it is the hormone that is stimulating the ovary to mature, ready to be released, and then ready to potentially make a baby. So it's got a really small job to do this yellow line, as you can see, but a really important, important job. So at ovulation, it does a little peak here to make sure that an egg is matured enough. And it is partnered by LH, luteinizing hormone, which is the hormone that does a massive spike at ovulation to make sure that the egg can expel from the ovary into the fallopian tube so we have a chance of making a baby if that be our wish. The other one that's worth talking about here, I will leave um, GNRH, but the other one worth talking about here is progesterone. Progesterone is the green line here, and that stays very low across the first part of our 
um, period. And then it really picks up in the second phase and that overtakes estrogen. And that's because progesterone is there to help to retain a pregnancy if pregnancy was present. If if um, a sperm met an egg, they had a date and they loved each other, then the egg will nestle into the womb, the lining of the womb, and progesterone is the hormone that stays high if it wants to keep it there. Progesterone dips in order to enable a period to begin. Now, on two ways, right? If a baby was in the making, we want mum to feel really chill. We want there to be a lot of calming energy, a lot of relaxation, a lot of peacefulness. And that's what progesterone delivers. It delivers a really lovely feel good hormone. It works on GABA in our brain, which is lovely for us. When progesterone tanks, our mood can tank with it. We're irritable. We're short tempered, not feeling so great. And that's why you can get that slight mood change before we go into our into our bleed and then the cycle starts again ladies tell me that makes sense tell me those feels of those hormones make a lot of sense so this is a natural cycle what's really important to understand is that there's no part of this cycle that should prevent weight loss and there's no part of this cycle that should prevent you going to the gym if you should so wish what you may feel is around the very end and the very beginning of your cycle is that you feel slightly more tired because your estrogen and your progesterone are dropping. So you feel slightly more tired. You might feel a little bit more lethargic. You might ache a little bit more and you just might not be in the mood. Now, that's OK. It's OK to listen to your body, to be very aware of what's happening and decide, you know what, I'm just going to go for a long walk today instead, because that would be a beautiful thing to be out in nature. Going for a long walk would be a wonderful thing to opt to do at that time of your cycle. It's OK if you don't feel like lifting weights. You might feel from sort of the middle section here that that is sort of prime time because you're going to have good energy. You're going to have feel good hormones. You're gonna, your hormones are going to be working with you for strength and everything like that. So some people walk through their cycle, don't notice a single difference from day one to day 28. Some people notice a real difference. Have a real think, track your cycles, have a real think about what you feel um, and the symptoms that you experience, because that can then really help us to know how best to approach our workouts. Equally, you're going to get cravings normally around this time of your cycle when we're heading down towards a period. And that's again because of the change in hormones. You probably only need about an extra 200 calories. If we want to cal calorie it, you probably only need about an extra 200 calories a day for what your body's going through. And you're much better going for leaner proteins with that extra 200 calories or vegetables. And the reason being, if we think back to insulin resistance, if we think back to having sugar in the blood, when our hormones drop like that, we respond a lot more rapidly to carbohydrates and therefore we get higher blood sugars. Insulin has to play a bigger role and we can end up on a bit of a, a moody roller coaster because of it and an energy roller coaster because of it. So I would look at very much taking an extra couple of hundred calories, but putting it into some really good veggies um, or, or some lean proteins there too. So I am I know we've got one minute left. What I can do is take a picture so what we can do, Natalie, if you don't mind, uh, let's just yeah. refresh. Let's just refresh uh, the link. We're gonna use the same link, uh, guys. So just get off from the from the Zoom call and then get in with the same link, okay? And then we're gonna just cover uh, everything that is left in ten minutes because um, I don't want to make longer than an hour uh, this for the sake of all of our time. So let's go. Okay. See you shortly. Same link. I mean, look, at the moment, guys, it's really hot. <laughs> Sleep is just going to be disrupted. And it was one of my main things on uh, on my post today was, do you know what? If you do wake up in the middle of the night, just rest. Know you're resting and stay really calm. If you get stressed, you're going to wake yourself up even more. So just stay calm. Enjoy the rest. Maybe put on something like a nice podcast or something on airplane mode. and Just chill. Um, you'll either fall back asleep or at least you've not stressed yourself out. But what we need when we eat, we need specific neuro um, 
we need specific amino acids to support neurotransmitters in our brain. So amino acids are the building blocks of protein. And we know that um, animal products have complete amino acids. So a steak will contain all amino acids. Whereas if you prefer to eat plant-based, then you need to really mix up your different plant proteins to make sure you're getting all the amino acids covered because there's only quinoa and soy and chia seeds that are complete amino acids. So tryptophan is the key amino acid that we need from our diet that then converts all the way down to serotonin, which is a happy hormone, and to melatonin, which is our sleepy hormone. So in order to help us with sleep, we need to think about eating tryptophan rich foods. And I've put a list for you there. I'm gonna share this um, presentation so you'll have a copy of it, but there's a list for you here. So you could think you could actually make a really lovely, if you needed like a bedtime smoothie out of this, couldn't you? You could do some milk with um, some almonds or some almond milk. You could do it with a banana. You could pop in some pumpkin seeds and you could pop in a little bit of protein powder as well to support your blood sugars. And then that's a really lovely bedtime smoothie there if, um, if you're struggling with that. More often than not, People who do struggle to get off to sleep and particularly those who wake up in the middle of the night, it's a blood sugar balancing problem, um, especially that sort of 2, 3 a.m. wake up call. As I said, not from the heat, but from that sort of 2, 3 a.m. I wake up or 4 a.m. I wake up. It's probably blood sugar related. So think about getting things in check during the day. Think about whether potentially you're not tolerating that volume of carbohydrates that you're consuming and you're getting a little bit insulin resistant. Have a think about whether you can get a check with your GP. Not that they'll check you for insulin resistance. That's not what the NHS will do. But, um, you know, feel free to come into my world and ask me questions as well. But also think about creating a really good routine. The body loves routine. It loves rhythm. That's probably the same when you're working out and things. Amir, I'm sure, really encourages you to pick really good routines with your workout so that they become easy and they're not difficult. Um, call the room right down difficult at the moment but the body the room about 18 degrees is a really nice temperature I sleep with my windows open all year round even when it's snowing outside I have a very very cold bedroom and it really helps me to sleep I sleep like a baby um reduce blue light so I've actually got blue light blocking glasses on this evening with our screens with our mobiles with an artificial light with the tv it's all blue light into our eyes which actually stimulates the wakefulness of our brain um, and it suppresses melatonin. So really think about downtime, candlelight, getting some blue light blocking glasses. The better ones are when they've got orange lenses. They're even stronger than these. I didn't think you'd think I was very cool if I turned up with my orange lenses on tonight. <laughs> Um, leave mobiles at the door. Don't take your mobile to the bed and doom scroll all night. Think about that doom light, that, that um, blue light that's coming in and the hours you're missing. And then think about some other basics. Do you need a sleep mask? Do you need to put the rainforest on in the background, otherwise known as brown noise? And is alcohol disrupting your sleep a little bit as well? And, and would knocking that on the head help? And then I've no slides for this one, but I really wanted to talk about these last two. Are gluten and eggs bad? So um yes i will give you my details right at the end no problem at all so gluten and eggs are they bad i'll start with eggs if you are allergic to eggs please do not eat eggs anything you're allergic to and i mean an allergy a true allergy is thinking about anaphylaxis it's thinking about you are gonna be vomiting you're going to have instant vomiting and anaphylaxis and it's a real concern don't eat it Otherwise, eggs are great. The myth around eggs and cholesterol was dispelled um, some time ago now, so that's not a concern. Um, I eat a four egg omelette most days. And for me, it's probably one of, you know, eggs are one of the most versatile um, superfoods that nature gives us. So I'm a big fan. Do you think about quality of eggs? So if you can get your eggs from um, a local farmer or organic, then the better. Um, happy hens create happy eggs. And gluten, gluten can be an issue if they're, so if you are celiac, gluten is an allergy for you and I would recommend avoiding it. There is also such thing as non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is coming up a lot more. We do it in private testing. The NHS don't test for it currently, um, but we do see that a lot more. We see it mainly with people who have got disrupted guts. 
So if there's a lot of bloating, if there's a lot of flatulence in the gut, if potentially you've had a lot of medication, antibiotics over your time or or a disrupted gut when you were traveling, then gluten in that sort of gut can create more inflammation. So it might be something that if you have got a lot of gut disruption, you want to remove temporarily while you look at healing your gut and rebalancing it and bringing that bloating down. Um, and then try and reintroduce it again, um, unless, of course, as I say, you are celiac. The other, the only other time I would remove gluten is if you have an autoimmune condition, because the immune system is already over responding on itself, creating an autoimmune condition. Gluten can um, be a one of a, a key trigger for autoimmune conditions. So I would remove gluten in that instance, too. Cooking at home versus eating out. You're always going to get. Well, I say always, you will most likely get a much better quality of meal when you cook at home. And the reason being that you are in control of your ingredients, you're in control of the oils that you use, you're in control of the amount of salt that you use as well. And when we go to a restaurant or we go to a takeaway, the oils are really cheap. They use sunflower oil, vegetable oil, they heat it to a very high temperature so it's bubbling away. And then that is very, very inflammatory for our bodies. When we, I'm going to scoot back very quickly to here. Here where you see, I've said about trans fats. So trans fats are not found in nature anywhere. Trans fats are man-made. Take a an oil like a sun vegetable oil or a seed oil and we heat it to a high temperature we actually break the bonds of the fat so just like carbohydrates are strings of um, sugar tied together fats also have a similar um, bond structure and when we heat those cheap oils to a high temperature they break and we create a trans fat never found in nature only found by man because man made it industrialized food made it um, and that's why when you go out for dinner or you eat fried food or you eat at a takeaway or a restaurant we don't know the depth of how they're cooking our food or the choice of their oils so at home you can have a really lovely extra virgin olive oil you can cook on a low to medium heat so that it doesn't bubble and it doesn't smoke um, you can cook your food rather than char grill it you can steam your vegetables to retain as much of the nutrients in them as possible and you can really manage um, all your additional herbs and spices and things and not overdo the salt so it is always going to be better generally obviously not knowing all your cooking styles it's generally always going to be better to um, cook at home because of the control that you can have on it. If you do not feel you're a good cook, hands up if you think you're not a good cook or you can't cook. Don't leave me hanging. Why am I on my own? <laughs> I don't can last myself as a very good cook. I let my husband do most of the cooking. I love good food. I love to shop for good food. I'm very fussy about where we buy our food from. I'm very fussy about directing him with what sort of foods I want to make sure that we consume. But I let him do the cooking most of the time because he sometimes enjoys it, but also he's just very good at it. When I do it, I takes a lot more concentration to do it. And I never follow a recipe. I'm too much of a rebel. So I genuinely think anyone can cook, though, because I can do a steak and a load of vegetables. I can cook a steak and steam a lot of vegetables. I can put a lot of chopped vegetables in a pan with some bone broth and make a soup and blitz it up. There is not really much in there that we need to worry about cooking. You don't have to think about gourmet meals. You can think about assembling food together. You can think about having your protein, having your carbohydrates, having your vegetables, having your healthy fat and assembling it on a plate to make it work for you. You don't need to worry about stressing yourself out being a super duper cook. It's about really good food, really effectively done so that you enjoy it. And that is me. I will just have a look. I'll leave this here for you, but I'll let me have a quick check on the questions here. What if you are intolerant to gluten? If you're intolerant to gluten, I would probably um, consider why you're intolerant to gluten. I'd probably want to know a little bit more about where that intolerance has come from. And potentially, is there a disruption in your gut where if we fixed um, the disruption of microbiome and we help to heal the gut lining and bring down inflammation, would you be able to handle gluten again? And that's a question that would depend on how the intolerance came about, yes or no. Um, so I hope that helps. 
Um, and you save a lot of money when you eat at home. 100% you do. God, especially these days. Um, Natalie, could you give us your details? Yet yeah, details are here. Can we sleep? Can sleep paralysis be linked to what we eat before bed? Oh, do you know what? Really good question. I don't know much about sleep paralysis. It's not my area of expertise. So I wouldn't be able to answer that without um, having uh, having a look at the research and having a look at more information on that. I wouldn't want to answer and um, and make a guess. That's a very good question. Um, yes, um, I was speaking that a certain a couple of my students I haven't put X, and it is because it's a lot of um, misinformation. So what I try to do when they are starting at foundation levels with me first weeks and they come with a lot of uh, body inflammation. I try to put away gluten and eggs for the first four weeks or six weeks just to make sure that they might be the cause. I totally see that you are not, um, how can I say, against eggs. But in my case, sometimes uh, eggs might be the ones that no many people will assimilate. But that just depends on each uh, professional using their tools, right? Would you consider that or how would you take the kind of like approach that I take with my students, Natalie? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And if we're thinking about uh, what is causing inflammation, um, and if we're thinking of the, the belly inflammation as well and what's caused, I do the basics first. As I said, I think about insulin resistance. I think about stress. I think about um, toxins and I think about gut health. If there is autoimmunity involved, I definitely look at gluten. And I think eggs is a really good shout. Gluten, eggs, soy, corn, peas including chickpeas can be some of the main culprits of adding uh, inflammation um but if eggs and if eggs don't turn out to be an issue then i'd look at bringing them back into the diet because they can 100%. be really helpful and then something that i do as well so then um because it's really good to have a second point of view of, of course of other another professional but i just want to uh, reinforce that guys in every single professional that you will go for example i've been working with different mentors and coaches around the, the last 10 years and they have different sources they have different approaches to take you to to the results that you're looking for see so then when you want to explore for example in the internet or you want to ask 10 different professionals they will give you 10 different ways sometimes and it's just because mm. that's how they learned so that doesn't mean that it's not going to get you the results as long as you are not getting worse <laughs> that's that's a that's that's a good sign that you that you are potentially going in a, in a good way. In my case, I try to go be, very minimalistic. I really like to you to make sure that you are so repetitive with certain patterns that then is becoming a habit, and then you are unlearning things to you to learn new things. And sometimes that it will sucks, but you know that that's how you get the results first in the first four weeks. Like Vitor, uh, we we are smashing it because he is repetitive. So when you are repetitive, sometimes you are teaching yourself, okay, look at, I'm feeling more lighter, I'm feeling more energized, I'm feeling more happier, I want to do more things. And it's because sometimes you are doing it just super simple, super basic, and then slowly we can create flexibility and we can add more things. But that's my approach. But maybe Natalie is taking mm -hmm. different, so I would love to, to hear that point of view as well from you. I think that's really important to say. When you've got a coach, when you've got a nutritionist, whoever it is, they're going to know you the best. You know, my clients fill out a very comprehensive health question is long. And then we spend an hour together before we really get going. And so I end up knowing an awful lot about them to back what I choose for them. And it's very personalized. Amir is going to know more about you than I do. This is coming from my perspective of what I see in clinic. But as I agree with Amir. Everyone you go to, you're going to that person because you trust their guidance lean into their guidance, let it be um, something that you explore and and see how it goes because it can, eggs can be a cause of um, of issue. So you might, if you take something out and then when you bring it back in, you tend to know. Exactly. But yeah, that's, that's different things. Do you see guys? So, okay, any any other questions? This is the time guys, because uh, usually- So I've just got one that. here. Uh-huh, let's go. What is the best time to have our last meal before bed? I'd say a minimum of two hours before bed, but if you can try three to four, then even better. You need to really digest your food before you then go and lie down. Um, so I'm thinking of that from a digestive function, from a sleep capacity function. 
yeah that's what I would that's what I would suggest during menstruation I feel really I feel extremely hungry and I'm in diet what foods can help without taking too much calories I go in with the lean proteins because they're going to be your most calorie efficient and your vegetables are going to be your most calorie efficient as well um, and I'd really think about your overall blood sugar. I think about whether you've had the opportunity to sleep a little bit more as well to make sure your energy is in a good place. Um, and potentially, I'd really want to think about overall, maybe considering the likes of a magnesium supplement or something like that. I don't agree with self-supplementation. I will say that at the same time as saying something like magnesium is a fairly safe mineral to take. Um, and something like that can be really helpful as well if you don't, um, if you can't quite knock it on the head. Um, make sure you're well hydrated as well. Please make sure you're well hydrated. What is your opinion on how much protein we should eat? And is it possible to eat a lot? Is it possible to eat too much? Um, people with kidney issues can eat too much protein. People with kidney issues, um, I actually don't work with people who have kidney disease because they are such a delicate organ. Um, but people with kidney issues really need to be careful of their protein and they should be eating the least. Um, if your kidneys are beautiful and healthy, which I really hope they are, then you're going to be having to eat an awful lot of protein to start causing damage. There was a concern at one point that, you know, these sort of gym goers were causing issues. Um, we don't really see it until we're getting up to a really high amount. And actually, by that point, you're more likely to suffer from nutrient deficiencies because you're over consuming protein and under consuming your vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and things. So it ends up becoming a, a bigger issue. Um, so in, when I see people in clinic, I tend to like to put them on 1.2 to 1.5 gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. Um, this sometimes goes up to 1.8. If I'm dealing with athletes, we probably end up around two, but it's going to be really individual and it's really going to depend on where they're starting. Um, and I'm sure Amir covers this a lot with you. Um, there you go. Yeah. So you'd start at 1.2 as well. Um, what fluid intake do you recommend for your clients? Um, I tend to recommend everyone goes to, um, two liters of water a day. The more vegetables I see come in, the more I know that probably water is being uptaked there, but two liters of water a day. Um, and that can be through filtered water um, or herbal teas as well. They count, but coffee and black tea um, don't count. Yes. And just- uh, I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, something Please? else, just to wrap up, uh, would you recommend the more mental is your work? And the more uh, you, your your brain is dedicated to do to do your work, would you recommend drinking more water or not? Or it won't change. I'd recommend much? three kilogram uh, three liters. I'd recommend three three liters of water when you're sweating, like we have been this week. No, no, I mean, I like, absolutely recommend three liters. No, no, when I mean when it's a more mental work, like for example, you are in a work that is really high paced. You are thinking a lot. You are dealing with a lot of uh, calls uh, because most of, of my students they they are really in, into a work on that they are leading people, and I, I mm -hmm. have a belief that that what works for me. And I say to them, you need to check yourself, your energy levels. But in my case, I will even a uh, drink up to four liters because I'm active mentally and physically, but that what works for me. When I go lower than three liters, I will have headaches. My, my eyes is going to get dry. I know myself that much that I know if it's missing more or less. So what would you say? It, will you think that increasing your water intake, if it's too mental work, you work or not in regards to the water intake? So, when we're doing a lot of mental work, when potentially we're under an element of stress in our work as well, because of the amount of output and the responsibility on us, what we really need is not necessarily more water. We probably need electrolytes in our water. Like when salt. we are stressed, like salt, when we, and a good quality salt, not a table salt, but something mm -hmm. like a high mineral salt, a uh, Himalayan salt or something like that. And just a pinch, it shouldn't necessarily taste salty. <laughs> but when we're in a high stress environment, and you know, then we can sort of feel a bit more thirsty. We get drier, eyes get dry. Everything gets a lot drier. It's because um, we're not regulating the body's ability to um, balance our water out. So mm -hmm. I'd probably then recommend that rather than piling on more water, I'd pop electrolytes in to make sure the balance of water was was appropriately measured. But yeah, I mean, when it gets hot or if you work out a lot, because you'll be detoxing and releasing sweat through your skin, then, um, then you probably do want to add on um water to accommodate perfect um 
There's just one here. Is there a special <laughs> diet for people with IBS? Where to get a good list of products or meal plan? I'm going to say something which is probably really controversial. It's, well, it's becoming less controversial. Is that IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, is probably one of the worst diagnoses the doctors have ever come up with <laughs> because it doesn't tell you anything about what's going wrong with your gut. It mm. tells you you've got an irritable bowel. Well, you knew that. You didn't need the doctor to tell you that. You knew that. You went to the doctor and told him or her. So for me, IBS is BS. It doesn't help an individual to tell them that they've got IBS. It really doesn't. You want to understand why you have IBS. So the biggest, biggest, biggest part of my life and my world and my work is to continually ask the question why until I've got to the root cause of why somebody is in front of me saying I'm tired, my gut's complaining, I've got this, that and the other. I ask why enough question, uh, enough times to get to the issue. So I'd want to know, are you digesting your food properly? So use the biggest tip anyone can take away from here if they experience inf uh, bloating or flatulence or feeling of fullness after foods like you don't digest very well is chew your food. Chew your food really, really well. We don't chew anymore. We don't use our teeth. Chew your food really well. Make it mush before we swallow. Are you digesting well? Is your stomach functioning well? Or is there potentially some level of stress that's depleting your stomach's ability to function well? What are your, what's your balance of uh, microbiome like? Is there an imbalance that's causing this disruption here? And how inflamed um, is your gut lining um, that's potentially causing these IBS symptoms? Um, and I'd also think about transit time and things like that. People come to see us. I had a client who had 30 years of IBS and within six months she was a brand new woman. And she couldn't believe that for so long she was diagnosed in the 90s. So back then IBS was like, oh, we know what it is. Not. <laughs> so 30 years she suffered for um and yeah within six months she was a completely different person able to go on holiday and not worry so uh seek a, seek a better understanding of what's going on in the gut would genuinely be my advice exactly um uh, do you want to go with the last one and then shall we wrap up <laughs> would you recommend electrolytes on a daily basis in this heat yes it, it but it, it is all, I would say it also depends, uh, as you said, but well, of course, if you're sweating too much, you will need electrolytes, but something that I encourage you guys, and please do take that time, every single little time through taking notes about yourself, learn about yourself, because sometimes when you're having a headache, the first thing that you go is to take a ibuprofen or a paracetamol or something like that. Learn <laughs> about yourself, learn about how nutrition is accepting on your body learn learn about how a, a specific training is affecting on your body so then i can help you but sometimes you just want to have the quick fix and the quick fix is not going to teach you anything and you know that already if you've been working with me for more than three months you know that i'm pushing you a lot to learn about yourself so that's what i love you that need to, no no it, that's that's my my thing so that's that's what you need to understand guys for a reason not to even giving you a lot of information regards to food and stuff, but if you are just applying it because you are supplying it, but you are not learning how to how you're assimilating that, how you're processing all that, it won't work. You gotta so, you gotta get back in touch with your body. You've got to know if your body feels a certain way, ask why does it feel that way? What have I done? What have I eaten? How have I slept? How have I lived that may have contributed to this feeling? not let's pop a paracetamol and crack on because that's why in the modern day world we are where we are we need to ask more questions we need to go deeper we need to reconnect with ourselves um and you'll feel so much better for it's it it's nothing wrong to you to be curious okay it's nothing wrong absolutely to it. um and nobody's gonna be mad about you for being curious you you need to be that curious person as you was a little one it's nothing wrong with it all right guys uh, they yeah. don't teach us in the school when you're asking too much in school they say okay you need to shut up and you just need to listen to, to the teacher it's not like that for a reason i have i didn't finish high school because i was asking most of the time things and then i teach myself as now you know but it's a different story a different game you know that all the time i'm gonna target your mindset rather than going in a different path for that reason i like to bring specialists like natalie in a different path she have a different to totally different way of teaching you guys do you realize regards to myself i teach in a different way right but that's beautiful that's super beautiful okay and i'm gonna start uh, bringing more special guests follow her because she's she's really passionate as me 
and then you can have different sources and then you can just start making your own thing. Remember, whatever we tell you is not a hundred percent right because we have so many people. It's, it's kind of like something that we is we think that is gonna be the best, but sometimes it might not be a hundred percent. You need to try it for a reason. You need to learn if it's gonna work. And that's when you're starting working one-to-one -one with a professional. So then it can dedicate time and energy to you. But you're just going on, on Instagram, TikTok, uh, and, and you see the trend and say, oh my God, I'm gonna lose 10 kilos in two weeks. But it's for a hundred million people. All right, for a reason you're paying us, or well, you're paying me and I'm paying Natalie today <laughs> uh, to make things happen for you, see? <clears throat> so, okay, guys, now go to bed, evening routine and sleep time. Absolutely. You're very welcome to come and join me. As Amir said, feel free to come into my world on Instagram. Feel free to come and join my free group, that blood sugar group. Um, and I'm releasing tomorrow that blood sugar fix, which is one of my programs. And um, if you're in my group, you'll hear all about it. But I'd love to see you again. Thank you all so much for showing up tonight. You are most welcome. Um, 